Good afternoon, everybody. How's the volume? Is it pretty good? All right. Well, welcome to the Octagon Center for the Arts. My name is Heather Johnson. I'm the director here, and we are very excited to have a very special guest today. Um, this is held in conjunction with the 150th exhibit, and I want to say, too, thank you specifically to Ames Historical Society. We have some representatives upstairs in the balcony that's recording. And uh, yeah, we also have items affiliated with this exhibit that are for sale, books, uh, special coffee, and whatnot. So please, yeah, help out. Um, you know, there's the special items. We also have multiple books by Ted Kuzier over here in the corner. And uh, they also will be available in our shop after today's event. So if you decide you needed to grab one more copy, just stop by our shop, we'll have them available. And also, we have one more week left of the special exhibit. So if you know of friends or others who would like to enjoy it, please let them know that this is the last week of this very fantastic show that will be on display here. So uh, again, after the event, feel free to look around, too. We have brochures about the event, but the Hames Historical Society did a great job, did a whole lot of work with this exhibit. So um, it's well worth the view. And I want to also thank the Ames Commission on the Arts for this special event with Ted Kuzier, uh, as well as the Ames Community Grant Program, too, and a bunch of other sponsors that helped the exhibit that are listed on the program and uh, the poster. So thank you so much for the local support and making this great uh, event exhibit, as well as the ability to have Ted Kuzier here as a special guest. So I am very honored to have uh, Ted Kuzier here with us again. It's been a couple years. He was here about five years ago. Um, many of you know that he is an Ames native, and he is a two-time United States Poet Laureate from 2004 and 2006. Um, he's very heavily regarded as poetry. In 2005, he won a Pulitzer for his Delights and Shadows, which we also have copies of here, too. He's been published in numerous newspapers, and reviews, um, The New Yorker, The Hudson Review, The National, The American Poetry Review, um, The Antioch Review, I could go on and on and on. And he has also received two NEA fellowships in poetry, multiple prizes, and uh, he's currently residing in Nebraska, and he's teaching there at, um, is it the Lincoln? There in Lincoln, Ted? You're so we are very honored to have Ted Kuzier here in Ames Native, and uh, Ted, would you please be so delightful to come up and do a little reading for us? And you'll also be signing books, too, afterwards. Thanks for turning out today. Um, it's a lot of fun for me to be back. I, I drove over early this morning from Nebraska and went to um, the 11 o'clock service at First United Methodist over here where I was baptized 75 years ago. And, and one of the things about getting older that, that, um, that I'm beginning to realize is that you, know, you, you forget how old you really are. And I went in there this morning thinking, why there may be some people here who remember my parents. <laughs> and, uh, not the case at all. Matter of fact, I was among the very oldest people there. Um, I had an adventure right over here as a little boy I thought I'd tell you about. Um, one of my schoolmates, I, I guess I better not cite his name, was, a, was very good at thievery for fun. <laughs> and it was stealing things from stores uh, just to be doing it for the excitement of it. And he convinced me that I ought to try it. And there was a dime store over on the south side of, of Main Street at that time. And with great trepidation, he told me how to do it. He said, go in and act casual, walk up and down the aisles, and when nobody is looking, snatch something and then put it in your pocket and leave. I thought, okay, you know, I'm terrified. I suppose I was maybe eight or nine at the time. So I went in the dime store, and the man who ran it was at the cash register in the front, and, and I, I can still smell the peanut oil in that dime store and, the, and those old wooden floors and so on from roasting peanuts. And, and uh, I walked up and down the aisles, and the only thing that I thought that I could reach were some bobby pins, and they were 
there were two packets of bobby pins for a nickel. So I stood there, you know, in the aisle way too long, and then grabbed a package of these bobby pins, ran out, ran the full length of the store, boom, 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 out through the front door, around the corner of the Union Story Bank, and threw them in a garbage pail, and then ran all the way home and spent the entire afternoon sitting in the basement, waiting for the police to come <laughs> to take me away. And I can't go by that, that old bank building without thinking of that day. You know? I, mean, I, I, think the, I think the anxiety went on probably for weeks, you know, but before I figured out that nobody was going to come after me after that. <clears throat> I thought I'd start today with um, a couple of Ames poems. I, I've been writing about Ames pretty much all my writing life, but um, uh, you know, some of them have been published, some have not, and so on. This one is um, about the old rendering works that was out here on the, on the, on the creek. Um, we, would, we did a lot of fishing there, it's explained in this thing and everything, but um, this poem is, uh, is about to appear in Harper's, so the, the Ames rendering works is going to get some national exposure after all those years. Ames Byproducts. That was its business name, but everybody in town called it the Rendering Works. And it stood in its stink on the wooded west bank of the skunk, its parking lot half full of rundown trucks, nosed into carcasses piled at the downwind side, brown, rank, and bloating. Through willows that grew along the bank, I once saw one of the workers using the dusty flank of a horse as a bench to eat his lunch, the sandwich wrapper a glitter of flies on the hide beside him. Out of a pipe like a piece of gut, a gray-blue trickle had eaten its way across a grassy mud bar, and the skunk brought bullheads lipping up to it, the fightingest and fattest up and down the river, and we had fished it all the way from Soper's Mill down to the high Chicago and Northwestern trestle, beneath which our childhood was flowing away. There was a girl in our sixth grade class whose father worked at the rendering works, up to his elbows in blood gone wormy, blue and curdling, a poor man growing poorer by the year, blue work shirts worn as thin as window screens along the clotheslines in their yard. She was taller and older than us, from having moved from school to school and had big, interesting breasts before the other girls had any, and it made us mean as snakes. We pinched our noses behind her back as if she stunk, though she was always clean and combed, cycling her few good dresses through the weeks. She did their laundry, hung out the wash, showing a good part of her legs as she bent to the basket. And it seemed it was only the two of them there as we rode our bikes past over and over again. She was cool and aloof in our schoolroom, her eyes disdaining ours, already a woman, inexplicable. And then one day she was gone, her father's damp shirts gone from the sagging rope, and the screen door hooked forever over who she may have been behind it. A coming of age poem. We don't, we don't often think about racism in, in these communities, but it's been with us all these years. And um, I was talking to Dennis earlier about the Ku Klux Klan here in the 20s. And when I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska in 1964, the Klan still had a number in the phone book as late as 64. But um, this is a poem I wrote some time ago about about that period. Creamed corn. The Jamaicans who came to can corn at the Green Giant plant in the 40s were sinuously thin and so black that a lame word offered to them in greeting went right through their skins without raising a ripple. Our own black families, we spoke that way of our black families, the Martins and Ships 
had lived among us so long it no longer mattered. But these Jamaicans were different. They kept to themselves in loose clusters and knives flashed from the shadows when they picked their teeth or scraped Iowa from under their pale, perfect nails. And when they talked, they sounded like pianos. All over the keyboard went their honky-tonk laughing and talking. Word got around that out of pure spite and meanness, sometimes they peed in the cream corn as it sloughed through the trough. Then the plant shut down for the year, and they were gone. And neighborly old Bob Martin rose up and went down, up and down, in his place, running the lift in our only hotel. Years later, wherever we've gone, whatever we've come to, our ignorance spoiled the cream corn. <clears throat> I have a couple of new books. Um, this one is called The Wheeling Year, a Poet's Field book, which uh, appears to be a journal. Somebody asked me earlier if it really was a journal, and it, of course it isn't really a journal, but, but it looks like one, and um, I thought I'd, um, it's set up over the years, so I thought I'd read a little bit of the October passages to give you an idea about it. Each of these leaves had just one chance to feather the air with an arabesque of yellow or red, backlit and buoyant, just one chance to be held on the palm of the year, then briskly brushed away like an instant. Maybe 200 leaves lie piled together under this empty maple, their jumpsuits weighing them down with color, the wind knocked out of them. Quickly it passed, but how well they did it, falling like that, just simply falling. Over a barn door, a painted plank lintel, and on it a horseshoe held by two nails and spattered with red from repainting beneath and around it. And above this, bunched on the top of the board, and not much bigger than a walnut half, a gray-green tree frog, sleeping up there in the warm October sun. Just days from the first frost on the pale gravel lane that leads out to the dawn, the year's last lightning bug glows like a pebble reflecting the moon. In the crack rocks it lies weakened by cold, no longer flashing, a beacon that turned and turned over a warm summer sea sparkling with similar lights, but that this morning holds on to a steady glow, a pinhole in the curtain of time, letting in only a glimpse of eternity. It seems that for this morning, the, burden, the burdens of the world had been set aside. For the people I meet on the path are carrying nothing but leaves, red and yellow, riding the toes of their shoes. O oh, acorn, so you try a beret, but you still look, well, pretty ho-hum. You could sit there forever under your tree, hoping that someone might say hello, might lean down to tell you to have a nice day. From the side of a tree to the feeder, then back to the side of the tree again and again and again, such is the nuthatch's work, wearing his little usher's uniform of blue and white, black capped, and zip here he comes up the cool aisle of a late afternoon, a vicious fellow, making a breeze as he swishes past. Then zip, there he goes. Oh, Halloween. A woman I once knew, dead 20 years, lived with her young, self-centered husband in a rented apartment on the upper floor of an ordinary two-story white frame house. And in their living room was a door nailed shut to the attic stair, with the doorknob removed, just part of the wall, painted the wall's cheap color, with their thrift store couch pushed up against it. And evenings when her husband had gone off on one of his self-important errands, and she was left alone to wait for him, reading by the light of their thrift store floor lamp. 
She'd hear soft footfalls coming down the attic steps to stand behind the door as if some spirit wanted in or maybe wanted out. She said it didn't frighten her, but it was in some way comforting, holding its breath and waiting there behind her, teaching her the ways of patience with her husband gone. I have at last arrived at an age at which I can lean on a shovel while tending a fire of dry brush and see, as if on a brightly lit stage, all the people I have known and loved moving about, about among unfurled bolts of orange silk blown by great fans from offstage left, one of those big crowd scenes in which the whole cast laughs and chatters together until one figure steps forward to speak in a clear voice projecting his words from the edge of the stage, from the edge of the darkness, where the rest of us wait, clutching unreadable programs, trying to hear what has happened. I hate it when poets do this. <laughs> I had a guy come to the Library of Congress to read poems from Minnesota, and, we, and the readings there lasted a half an hour, and we had two at a time. And he not only fanned through all of his books trying to decide what to read next, he even got in his briefcase on the floor and shuffled, <laughs> shuffled through his briefcase at one point. How many people here knew um, Helen Mollison? She was a dear friend of our family. Uh, <clears throat> and this is, this is largely based on Helen. Applesauce. I liked how the starry blue lid of that saucepan lifted and puffed, then settled back on a thin hot pad of steam and the way her kitchen filled with the warm, wet breath of apples, as if all the apples were talking at once, as if they'd come cold and sour from chores in the orchard and were trying to shoulder in close to the fire. She was too busy to put in her two cents worth talking to apples. Squeezing her dentures with wrinkly lips, she had to jingle and stack the brass coins of the lids and thoughtfully count out the red rubber rings then hold each jar to see if it was clean, to a window that looked out through her backyard into Iowa. And with every third or fourth jar, she wiped steam from her glasses, using the hem of her apron, printed with tiny red sailboats that dipped along with leaf green banners snapping, under puffs of pale applesauce clouds, scented with cinnamon and cloves, the only boats under sail for at least 2,000 miles. <laughs> she, was a, she was a wonderful woman, and um, sitting in that church this morning, I could just see her there in the choir loft. <clears throat> this new book of mine, Splitting in Order, um, most of the poems in it, at least the, the first section, is... Um, is based upon the way we come together in life and, and um, help one another in one way or another. And I'll, I'm going to read a few of those. And, um, two men on an errand. This happened in a car repair shop I went over one morning. And I don't even remember what I was getting done, but I saw these two guys in the car repair shop. Those of you who are at, at all familiar with my work know that my subject matter is the ordinary world. I, I have, have yet to write a poem about anything heroic or amazing or anything like that uh, in the common sense of those words. <clears throat> but I like to look very closely at the way all of us are behaving and the kind of things that we carry around with us and so on. Two men on an errand. The younger, a balloon of a man in his 60s with some of the life let out of him sags on the cheap couch in the car repair shop's waiting room. 
scuff shoes, white socks, blue trousers, a nondescript gray winter jacket. His face is pale and his balding head nods with some kind of palsy. His fists stand like stones on the tops of his thighs, white boulders, alabaster, and the flesh sinks under the weight of everything those hands have squeezed. The other man is maybe 85, thin and bent over his center. One foot swollen into a foam rubber sandal, the other tight in a hard black shoe. Blue jeans, black jacket with a semi-tractor applique on the back, white hair fine as a cirrus cloud. He leans forward onto a cane with both hands at rest on its handle as if it were a steering wheel. The two sit hip to hip, a bony hip against a fleshy one, talking of car repairs, about the engine not hitting on all the cylinders. It seems the big man drove them here, bringing the old man's car, and now they are waiting. Now they have to wait or want to wait until the next thing happens, and they can go at it together, the younger man nodding, the older steering with his cane. And this is the title poem. This poem also appeared in my Valentine's book, but I wanted, I wanted this poem in this collection because of the way it deals with two people. Everyone in, in this room has seen this couple in this poem. Splitting in order. <laughs> I like to watch an old man cutting a sandwich in half. Maybe an ordinary cold roast beef on whole wheat bread, no pickles or onion. Keeping his shaky hands steady by placing his forearms firm on the edge of the table and using both hands. The left to hold the sandwich in place and the right to cut it surely, corner to corner. Observing his progress through glasses that moments before he wiped with his napkin. And then to see him lift half onto the extra plate that he asked the server to bring. And then to wait, offering the plate to his wife while she slowly unrolls her napkin and places her spoon, her knife, and her fork in their proper places, then smooths the starched white napkin over her knees and meets his eyes and holds out both old hands to him. Swinging from Parents the child walks between her father and mother holding their hands. She makes the shape of the Y at the end of infancy and lifts her feet the way the Y pulls up its feet and swings like the V in love between an O and an E who are strong and steady and as far as she knows will be there to swing from forever. Sometimes her father using his free hand points to something and says its name, the way the arm of the R points to the future at the end of Father, or the R at the end of forever. It's that forever the child puts her trust in, lifting her knees, swinging her feet out over the world. One of my friends who's here, um, just down to the Amana colonies, and I wrote this one um, driving past um, through that area on, on I-80 one morning, I'd been up at Michigan, in Michigan doing an event up there, and I saw these people in a field. Potatoes. On a misty sepia and green May, green May morning crossing Iowa, I saw from the highway a man, a woman, and a horse out sowing seed potatoes, using a two-wheeled planter from a hundred years ago the man beneath a straw hat holding the horse's reins and taking a sight on the post at the end of the field. The women perched behind above the tin potato bin, watching the steel disc roll along and fold the earth back under. The horse was brown as varnish as it pulled us forward, all of us, with black clay dropping from its shoes, and I was never surer of the world. 
this was this this moment in this poem is one of those moments like I was talking about a few minutes ago where where you see something happen that is just quite spectacular and it's very ordinary at Arby's at noon some of us were arriving hungry impatient while others had eaten and were leaving bidding goodbye to our friends and among us stood a pretty young woman blind her perfect fingers interwoven about the top of her cane and she was bending forward open-eyed to find the knotted lips of a man whose disfigured face had been assembled out of scars and who was leaving hurrying off and though their kiss was brief and askew and awkwardly pursed we all received it with a kind of wonder and kept it on our lips throughout the afternoon Here's another thing that everyone in this room has seen and um, many of you have participated in, changing drivers. <clears throat> Their nondescript late model car is pulled off on the windy shoulder, its doors flung wide, and the driver gets out, gripping the roof with a hand and lifting himself just as the woman gets out of her side, both of them stiff both kneading the small of their backs, rolling their heads on their necks, squinting into the midday sun. Then the driver starts out around the front bumper, swinging his legs as if they weren't his, his thin hair lifting, just as the woman straightens herself and sets out around the trunk, holding her permanent white curls in place with both hands. Both man and woman calling a few words back and forth across the axis of the car's hot roof as they stoop and fit themselves inside and the car's springs settle a little. And each of them reaches a long way out to pull the door shut, her door first, then his. And they rock and shift, fastening their belts. Then both of them lean forward almost simultaneously and peer into their side view mirrors to see whatever is bearing down from wherever they've been. And together they ease out over the crunching gravel onto the highway and move on. <laughs> Two. On a parking lot staircase, I met two fine-looking men descending, both in slacks and dress shirts, neckties much alike, one of the men in his sixties, the other a good twenty years older, unsteady on his polished shoes. A son and his father I knew from their looks, the son with his right hand on the hand roll, the father left hand on the left, and in the middle they were holding hands. And when I neared, they opened the simple gate of their interwoven fingers and let me pass, then reached out for each other and continued on. Here's a poem without a person in it. Um, I, I think Looking back, you know, every once in a while, somebody will ask me when I got started writing poetry, and it was, you know, it was in grade school, but I got serious about it in junior high and high school, and um, one of the poems that really captured me was um, Walter D. La Mare's poem, The Listeners, you know that poem? It's about a rider who rides up at night to an empty house and hammers on the door and hammers on the door and finally gives up and rides away into the night and he pauses on his horse and shouts back at the house, tell them I came, he said. You know. And I have been writing about empty houses ever since and or houses that have a kind of mystery to them. I've walked through hundreds of them out on the plains, you know, and written about them. And um, this is one that's in, um, up in Clayton County, Iowa, where my grandparents lived and my mother was raised. <coughs> while we were passing. As if it were waiting for someone, the house faced the road, 
its door held open by a little bronze dog, the lace curtains at its windows drawn back and tied. So the parlor must have been warm and yellow with a welcoming light. The siding had been freshly painted a sticky looking white with green screen windows and the customary battleship gray on the floor of the porch where two plain kitchen chairs were turned to face each other as if prepared for conversation. The grass was recently mowed and clipped by hand around the stones that lined the footpath to the door. And the clippings had been swept away. This happened the last Sunday in May, and on either side of the porch were peonies droopy with blossoms. And it looked as if someone had recently picked up the petals that had fallen, though more were falling as we passed, petal by petal in the indifferent, casual manner of peonies, and perhaps someone was standing just inside and watching them fall, almost feeling them fall, and was waiting to come out again now that we had passed, to pick up more of them, one hand packing them like tissues into the other, keeping an eye on the place where the road came toward her, wide and empty, out of the trees. I'm going to close with a poem um, called Pearl. It's from my Delights and Shadows book. Um, my mother died on the um, 23rd of March. 1998 in Cedar Rapids and I was there and the following morning I decided that I would drive up to Guttenberg where her best friend was in a nursing home to tell the best friend before she got the news in another way. So I got up very early and did that and, and um, we called this woman Aunt Sticky. Her name was, her maiden name had been Stickford. She was, uh, Sticky was having her breakfast in her room and, and she um, she said that mother had been writing to her and that she was, wasn't surprised that this had happened and so on. And, um, and she said a beautiful thing. She said, um, uh, your mother and I were such good friends, Ted, that we could sit in a room together for an hour and neither of us thought we had to say a word. Um, so I left her at that nursing home in Guttenberg and decided I would drive over to El Cater where uh, mom's, one of mom's last first cousins was living, Pearl Richards. And this is an account of, um, of that morning. This poem has been made into a movie, a 17 minute movie, um, really quite a beautiful movie. Um, if you're interested sometime, you can go on the New England Film Festival uh, website and search under Pearl and it'll come up. Again, it's 17 minutes. It's um, uh, was done by Dan Butler, who some of you may know from, um, he was on the Frasier show, he played Bulldog on Frasier, and then Francis Sternhagen plays, the, uh, plays my cousin, um, marvelous uh, actor now in her 80s. <clears throat> Pearl. El Cater, Iowa, a morning in March, the Turkey River running brown and wrinkly from a late spring snow in Minnesota, a white two-story house on Mulberry Street, windows flashing with sun. And I had come a hundred miles to tell our cousin Pearl that her childhood playmate, Vera, my mother, had died. I knocked and knocked at the door with its lace-covered oval of glass, and at last she came from the shadows and with one finger hooked the curtain aside, peered into my face through her spectacles, and held that pose a grainy family photograph that could have been that of her mother. I called out, Pearl, it's Ted, it's Vera's boy. And my voice broke, for it came to me nearly 60. I was still my mother's boy, that boy for the rest of my life. Pearl at 90 was one year older than mother and a widow for 20 years. She wore a pale blue cardigan buttoned over a house dress 
and she shook my hand in the tentative way of old women who rarely have hands to shake. When I told her that mother was gone, that she died the evening before, she said she was sorry that Vera wrote me a letter a while ago to say she wasn't good. We went to the kitchen and I sat at the table while she heated a pan of water and made us cups of instant coffee. She told me of a time when the two of them were girls and crawled out onto the porch roof to spy on my Aunt Mabel and a suitor who were swinging below. We got so excited we had to pee. <laughs> and we couldn't wait and peed right there on the roof. And it trickled down over the edge and dripped in the branches, but Mabel and that fellow never heard. <laughs> we took her, our cups into her living room where stripes from the drawn blinds draped over the world's fair satin pillows. She took the couch and I took a chair across from her. I've had some trouble with health myself, she said taking off her glasses and wiping them. And I said she looked good, though. And she said, I have started seeing people who aren't here. I know they're not real, but I see them the same. They come in the house and sit around and never say a word. They keep their heads down or cover their faces with claws. <clears throat> I'm not afraid, but I don't know what they want of me. You won't be able to see, but one's right there on the staircase where the light falls through that window, a man in a light gray outfit. I turned to look at the landing where a patch of light fell over the carpeted steps. Sometimes I think that my Max is with them. One seems to know his way around the house. What bothers me, Ted, is that they've started to write out lists of everything I own. They go from room to room, <laughs> three or four at a time, picking up things and putting them back. I've talked to Wilson, the chiropractor, and he just says that maybe it's time for me to go to the nursing home. I asked her what her regular doctor said, and she said he doesn't go, she doesn't go there anymore, that he's not much good. But surely there's medicine, I said, and she said maybe so, and then there was a pause that filled the room. After a while, we began to talk again of other things, and there were some stories we laughed a little over, and I wept a little. And then it was time for me to go to drive the long miles back. And she slowly walked me to the door and took my hand again, our warm, bony hands among the light hands of the shadows that reached to touch us but drew back. And I cleared my throat and said I hoped she'd take care of herself and think about seeing a real medical doctor. And she said she'd give some thought to that, and I took my hand from hers and waved goodbye, and the door closed. And behind the lace, the others stepped out of the stripes of light and resumed their inventory, touching the spoon I used and subtracting it from the sum of the spoons in the kitchen drawer. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, just give us a moment while we set him up for the book signing. Uh, if the line gets a little long, feel free to look at the exhibit a little bit and uh, come back when it's a little shorter. And again, we do have the books available for purchase up here. And also, if you need some more for gift giving for the holidays, they'll be here in our shop as well. So thank you for coming out. Uh, check out the exhibit. And thank you so much to Mr. Kuzier for delighting us with his wonderful words. Thank you. And Ted has actually just offered to take a few questions from the audience, if anybody has a few they would like to ask. I always like this part. <laughs> um, anybody, I, any, anybody have any kind of question for me at all while they're getting set up over here? Yes, back here on the aisle. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. This poem about Pearl, um, I, I read it in Colorado Springs um, a number of years ago and a doctor in the audience, a neurologist came up and he said, um, that's the best description of Lewy body syndrome that I've ever seen. And Lewy body syndrome is in fact a, a disease in which, a, a kind of dimension in which you begin to see people who aren't there. Um, but yeah, coincidences and things like that. Um, I, I've, been, um, I've been collecting coincidences for, oh gosh, more than 20 years. I have a whole journal of them, you know. And you, you become aware of them. After you become aware of them, they, they happen all the time. I mean, there might be four or five a day. Uh, I had one this last week, which was pretty dramatic for me. I, I teach a little at the University of Nebraska. And over the noon hour, I have a long noon hour, and sometimes I stretch out on the floor of my office and take a little nap. And the room was very bright, and I reached up on the bookshelf and I took down a, a chapbook short story that had been given to me by a guy named Joe Maiolo, who taught at Duluth. Really fine writer, nice guy. And um, it just was in reach, and I took it down off my bookshelf and tented it over my eyes to keep the sunlight out, took a little nap, woke up read a few words, but my student was due to come, and I, so I couldn't, so I put it back up on the shelf. Got home that night, and my friend Connie Wanek sent me an email, and she said, um, I just thought you'd like to know that Joe Maiolo has died. That kind of thing, you know. Lots of those things like that, you know. Yes? You still write every, every day early in the morning? I sit there every day early in the morning. <laughs> I'm hoping to write. Um, 28 days out of 30, I just write junk, if I write anything at all. But it's very important to show up for work, you know. If I, if I wasn't sitting there on the day the good one came, I wouldn't get it at all. Yeah. So yeah, I d I've done that for years. 4.30 to 7 is my time, yeah. Um, the, my, my prose book, Local Wonders, is available as an audio book. Um, my publishers have never been able to get together on the poems, you know. I'd like to do, if I do a disc, I'd like to go across several books like this, but they all have different publishers, so they get arguing about which one is going to do it, and nothing ever happens, so maybe it'll happen someday. There are some readings of me on the internet on YouTube and so on that people have made, so, yeah. How do you decide how to group your poems when you write them? Like, you know, you said, this particular collection is about people and this particular Well, I don't really. What, what happens is that, that I never think about anything but the poem that I'm writing at the time. And then after I get maybe 50 of them that have been in literary magazines, I spread them out on the floor and start seeing if there are anything, any similarities to them. And this group came out that way. I mean, I just, I, I noticed that I was beginning to write about these pairs of people, sort of, you know. So that's how I do it. I, it would be impossible for me to write a book. I mean, to sit down and think, this is the plan for this book, and then to fulfill it. Um, couldn't do it. But I can write, I can write lots and lots in little paragraphs and pieces, you know, that sometimes you can put together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. When was the first time that you uh, discovered you had this talent of uh, observing what you do? And I mean, it's something that's a discipline you've got to uh, get out there and talk to that to uh, observe things this way and be able to observe um, Well, you know, I, I, I've always drawn and painted, so I've, you know, I've, I've taught myself to look at things that way. I think maybe. That's been helpful to me. Um, it also pays to look twice at everything. Um, you know, we, we miss an incredible amount in our lives just simply by breezing by it, you know. But I just finished a poem this last week 
about a croquet ball that I found in the garage, rolled up against one wall. I've gone by it many, many times, but each time I went by it, I must have been picking up a little something off of it, you know, because I finally was able to put it, do something with it, you know. Yes, back there. Oh, I do, I do an immense amount of revision. Um, a short poem, like most of those I read, the shorter ones today, probably 30 or 40 versions by the time I get it done. Um, I want it to look as if it was effortless. Um, you know, as if a good watercolor painting, you know, where you, you see the stroke that's just like this. Of course, not everyone can do that, you know, but um, yeah, I want them to be as, as, as if I had just simply dashed them off. Um, but, but that, you know, sometimes it takes a week or two to do that, yeah. yeah. Yes? Did you write a magic wand, what would you wish for? I'm sorry, what? Did you write a magic wand, what would you wish for? Um, uh, I think I'd wish that my Yellow Lab, who is 13, would last a few more years. He's, uh, he's getting to the end of his days. I think I'd like to do that for him, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Do you have siblings? And if so, what are their interests or talents? I have a sister uh, who is three years younger, Judy, who also grew up here. Um, our, our lives are completely different. Uh, Judy is very much an extrovert, um, like my father. Some of you may remember my father. Um, <laughs> or may not. Uh, uh, Judy is an extrovert and I'm an introvert, like my mother. And um, maybe one more. Jan? Um, well, as a little, t when a little tiny boy up here at Beardshire School, I remember a, that a, a poem that Mother kept. Um, I love my dog, his padded paws. At Christmas, he's my Santa Claus. <laughs> at Easter, he's my Easter bunny. And then I don't remember where it goes from there, but obviously the rhyme would be funny. <laughs> uh, but, but that's all I can remember of those real early ones. Yeah. Um, Thank you.